Welcome our viewers, we are here again on Civic Space TV with a special discussion on the accountability for COVID funds. I know many Ugandans have since moved on. We remember the last pandemic, which is Ebola, but like the Ministry has said, the Minister of Health, COVID is still here with us. But there are also pending questions of accountability as to how COVID funds were used. And with me in the studio is a special team of guests led by Dr. Zahara Nampel. Dr. Zahara is the acting principal of law school, Makere, immediate former director of Uripec, the Center for Peace and Human Rights at Makere, mm. and that's the entity that has conducted this research on accountability for COVID funds. You're welcome, Zara. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here once again. Thank you. Mm. On the left of Zara is a Mr. Richard Kalunji, who is a medical practitioner and a health advocate. Mr. Kalunji, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's quite a pleasure talking about health, health issues and accountability around COVID-19 funds. And right next to me is Honorable Michael Kakembo. Yeah. Honorable Kakembo is a member of parliament for Interim Municipality. You're welcome, Honorable. Thank you. I have to associate myself with this thing. Thank you. Yeah. I know he has a recent assignment, which is exciting to the people, but we are discussing COVID. <laughs> and uh, we, he is a member of the Health Committee in Parliament. I'll start mm. with you, Dr. Zahara. Why are we here today? <coughs> Thank you, Sarah. And uh, once again, thank you for honoring us uh, with this space. Uh, we thank Civic, Civic um, TV for always highlighting issues that concern the citizen of Uganda. Um, I'm coming from the, the space created by the, a project, a research project that undertook a study on transparency and accountability of COVID resources in Uganda, uh, which we called the TACO project. The TACO project was initiated in uh, 2020, following the onset of the COVID, and uh, we are in the process of concluding it. Uh, it, was, it is being implemented by the Human Rights and Peace Center, uh, a research and advocacy unit of the School of Law at Macquarie University. Uh, why were we particularly interested in COVID issues? Uh, we start with the citizen, the citizen at the center of this conversation, because uh, the government of Uganda has ratified international instruments and agreements and agreed to respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of Ugandans. So when the COVID came on, a lot of resources were received by the government of Uganda both externally as well as those that were collected internally. But there wasn't a lot of conversation about the use of these resources. Uh, for the first time in my adult life, I saw a lot of philanthropy, local philanthropy from Ugandans, you know, collecting and donating so much towards the cause of COVID. But uh, we haven't had that much conversation and discussion about COVID resources. Let me start by giving you an idea about how much money we have spent on COVID. Our research reveals that um, about 4.3 trillion Uganda shillings has been spent on COVID in Uganda, collected both externally and internally. Um, and so this was dispersed to different uh, districts as well as MDAs in the country. Now, if you look at the health sector, that also benefited uh, we got money received by our regional uh, referral hospitals. In 2020, they received uh, 270 million shillings. Uh, 2021, they received 407 million shillings towards strengthening of treatment capacity uh, and contact tracing. Uh, there was also a lot of money that uh, went towards uh, procurement. For example, we spent about uh, um, 11 billion shillings on procurement of ambulances. We spent 90 billion on procurement of masks. Uh, we also spent 42 billion on strengthening or creating of the intensive care units 
in the regional uh, hospitals. So you can see that there's been a lot of money coming into the health sector for COVID. You will not forget what happened in the education uh, sector. Um, I think we received about 14 million US dollars towards printing of uh, educational materials. And uh, some money went out. Some districts got some photocopied materials and, and, and ETC. There was also money that has uh, been received on the COVID stimulus package. I think it's about uh, 219 billion. So, Sarah, when we're talking about how much money that has gone out on COVID, it is immense. Um, there are some good things that have come out from this whole conversation. As I mentioned earlier, the philanthropy, the fact that Ugandans, when they come together for a cause, can actually pull money for a good reason. And we've also seen strengthened capacities in our institutions, in our health sectors, the oxygen plants were uh, created, uh, the ICU units uh, were also strengthened. We saw recruitment of uh, staff, especially the, in the health sector, coming on board. So there's been some positives. However, there have also been negatives, and there are also information gaps that for us as Ugandans, as citizens, we want to ask that question. What is the role of the state in not only respecting citizens' right to health, but also protecting and also fulfilling? So they need to ask those questions. Um, whereas the government came together very quickly because this was a crisis and put together uh, some enforcement mechanisms. They had an inter-ministerial sector committee. There was, the, um, there was a, an enforcement unit by the UPDF. There were also the district task force committees. Uh, we saw, however, that there was a multiplicity of mechanisms, especially at the district, all of them running around, different ants running around, uh, trying to mobilize things around COVID. Um, so in that way, we had uh, so much duplication. And unfortunately, we forgot that COVID is not the first crisis, health crisis that we've had in the country. We've had Ebola. And uh, in our study, we went to Acholi, we went to Masaka, we went to, we did Kampala. And for example, in, in Gulu, they told us that, but we've dealt with COVID before. We have management structures that could handle uh, conflicts, sorry, uh, crisis, health crisis. So why did we have to have another health management system coming on board? So there were queries about this being a top-down approach that was being utilized by directives coming from the top, from the president, from the minister, do this and do that. We also saw, uh, because of this, um, the accounting lines that we normally use had been reallocated. So where you normally find the, the cow is the chief accounting officer at the district. Mm. Now we had the district health officer receiving funds and accounting for them. So actually undermining the already established structures. Where we had the, the district chairperson being the leadership at the district, now we had the RDCs and the RCCs, RCCs taking the, the, the lead. So we had multiple reporting and leadership lines, and there was so much confusion and catalogue. And in all of this, by passing procurement procedures, because everybody was saying, this is a crisis, we need to get this done. You know, so many tenderpreneurs, people coming in to, to create tenders and, and all that kind of mess. And then, of course, there are problems with the delays in disbursements of the funds, but we have not had much about the accountability. What has come to Parliament, and I'm glad that uh, Honorable is here, is a post-mortem of an audit report that was done by the Auditor General that now has come to the COSASE. We would have wanted to see something that is more, you know, direct and uh, in, in time, in time say, okay, as Parliament, we have re released this amount of money, what is it going to do? So those are some of the issues that we are trying to bring out do in this project and also trying to enhance citizen involvement and participation to ask questions. And during our project, we went around the different districts, you know, and asked questions over the radio, prompting people to start ask, calling on their leaders to say what is happening with COVID, despite the fact that the first big wave has passed. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. And maybe before I go to Mr. Karunji, I would like to know why do you think accountability and transparency is important for the public? As, uh, thank you, Sarah. As I mentioned earlier, the citizen is important, is the first person to whom the government owes a responsibility. Every time the government of Uganda takes a loan, for whatever reason, and in this case it was for COVID, 
the, the citizen at the end of the day is going to bear the burden. Yes. The citizen is going to pay the taxes to repay this loan. So at the end of the day, the government of Uganda owes it to the citizen of Uganda to know what is happening. How much have we borrowed? How much have we received? How much have we spent? And how much have we spent it on? By keeping the citizen you know, in, 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 in the darkness is, by fa is failing to fulfill that obligation of protecting and fulfilling the obligation as the government of Uganda to the citizen of Uganda. I hear you, and I would like to hear from the people in the trenches, the health practitioner. Mm -hmm. What happened during COVID? Did the taxpayer get value for money? And if you don't mind, you know, as Dr. Zara was talking, I was like, okay, but wait a minute. Even simple things, like where did the Coca-Cola jail come to go? <laughs> yes, yes. Mm. Give me the bread. And yes. tapeco mugs. Yes. Mm. Cooking oil from Bidi. And the egg is from Rigachi. Food in quarantine centers. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, I think we're handling a very pertinent topic and a very important discussion. Many times when they talk about transparency and accountability, many times that accountability and transparency is is demanded from us, the medical practitioners. If I'm a medical doctor, like if you get a medical doctor like myself, and I'm in a hospital, say regional referral hospital, like she has been saying, and at the national level, there are, someone is saying that uh, the regional referral hospitals have been supported with so much, mm. the ICU facilities are now working so well, they have spent so many billions on ambulances, Sometimes that is simply as much as it can be talked about. But it's important to compare it with what is actually happening on ground. But before I go into all that nitty grit of accountability and transparency, we need to understand that first of all for you, because healthcare is a, a system. It must work in some kind of organized system. So if you asked a Ugandan, or even if I asked any of you who is on this platform today, how you can define, or if you can tell me where you could go for which disease, which hospital offers, which service, <coughs> perhaps you may not know. And these are, you're perhaps part of the elites, the educated Ugandans. So for my mother who is in Muvende, if she sees Muvende Regional Referral Hospital, what does it mean to her? Is it a, a big hospital? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that if she went to a health center for it, it will be less? But I want to tell you that uh, Going by what I was saying, sometimes when I'm a doctor and I'm sitting in a health center four, and the health center four on paper is supposed to have an operating theater, it's supposed to have two doctors, it's supposed to offer care to mothers, cesarean sections and all that. What we actually have on ground may be different. The other day there was a very big story that broke out of a patient, pregnant mother, came in bleeding in pregnancy, was rushed to Mukono General Hospital. This is a hospital and by all definitions, you'd expect a hospital to really be a hospital. And this hospital had a general practitioner who fought through the trenches, like you are saying, and managed to do whatever he did and sent the patient to Kawempe Hospital. Now, Kawempe is a national referral hospital by name. The patient shortly later, sorry, shortly after, was sent to Mulago Women's Hospital because Kawempe National Referral Hospital could not have proper ICU care for this patient. So when Dr. Zahara talks about all these good things, what she calls positive, ICU, ambulances, mm, in which kind of system are they working? Scans. Exactly. Can you actually draw them out? I'll give you another example of recently when we had a very big conversation around the CT scans that came in. And I saw on our medical platforms, one of the conversations that was coming in, you know, what kind of model have they brought in? Is it the best model? And those were the conversations coming in. But these conversations are being led by people whose day, day by day practice is actually radiography or radiology. So if a radiologist does not know which kind of CT scans are being brought, and these are the radiologists who are going to be Using pushed it. to these facilities, mm -hmm. or if you put a CT scan in Kavale Hospital, is there someone going to use it there? So I don't go so much into that conversation, but what I'm trying to, to build is which kind of system is all this money being pushed into? Mm. Sometimes you see our politicians and technical people acting like they are on pressure to spend some kind of money. 
not so much on pressure to improve some kind of system. Mm. So if you take COVID-19 as an example, for us who do a bit of work on, in public health, we believe that uh, you need to spend a lot of money in community diagnosis and understanding the problem or the challenge. COVID-19 should not push you into throwing money at things like I've seen with the parish development model where money is being thrown into circles. I know the own people perhaps give us more information. So, but uh, you need to ask yourself, if you give money, for example, to this circle, what is the end game? When does it happen? How does it happen? Mm. I'll assure you none of these regional referral hospitals, 16 as there, has a proper ICU facility. If, if Kawempe National Referral Hospital doesn't have, or if Kawempe National Referral Hospital must send a patient to Mulago Women's Hospital, which is actually semi-private, perhaps yeah, sometimes I've, even charging mm, much as much, I've been there. Yeah, mm. so much as mm. uh, the money almost equal to what private. I would pay in a private hospital. Mm. So which kind of health system are we dealing with? Is mm. it for the parliamentarian? Is it for the Minister of Education and Health? Mm. Is it for the common Ugandan? Mm. So back to the figures. If we look at COVID-19 as it was, what were the major issues? Number one is COVID-19 is going to kill people, so protect the people. And how do you protect them? You protect them with number one, information. So I've been reading the report, mm. the first report that came out from uh, the Minister of Finance, Finance and uh, Economic Development. Mm. I think it's uh, the Budget Monitoring and Accountability Unit. Mm. And they're talking of monies that we are spent into sensitization, into okay. buying of masks, like you are yeah. saying. Yeah. By June 2020, just about, I think, three months after the announcement of the pandemic in Uganda, Parliament and I think Cabinet had already swung into action, throwing too much money into the public. And uh, all these development partners were already throwing money into the public. If you're working in a system where these things were actually very well targeted, Today, Uganda would not have the same health system like it had three years ago. Mm. But if I asked you, if you, for example, you went to a health center for right now, what kind of care can you receive? If you went to, if you Actually, talk to, I want to ask you a specific mm. question on that. As a health practitioner, can you tell Ugandans? Because we thought the money pumped in hospitals for COVID would help, you know, re rejuvenate the health infrastructure yeah. that was dilapidated. Yes. Can you mention one, two, three dividends mm. that a Ugandan taxpayer has got out of COVID? Mm. Do we, for example, have a national ambulance system? Where did the donated vehicles go? Mm. Do we have and, and there were pickups purchased for mm. COVID? Yes. Can we say clearly here that every district in Uganda has now a vehicle that at least transports patients like an ambulance? Mm. You know, when you're talking of systems, you talk of players and you also talk of outputs. In terms of players, the Minister of Health, as a, as a player, took center, center yes. space in this, in this area. So much that I don't know if they were sitting in meetings and sitting with technical people like they were telling us and coming up with a proper direction. But, you know, the, among the players, there's also the public. Because the public had prevailing problems or prevailing challenges. Mm. So as you address the COVID, which is a new challenge, <coughs> you need to address it alongside the other prevailing challenges. Mm. If you throw, like I've said, one of the biggest benefits perhaps that you look at is if you procure equipment like we've seen, how is this equipment going to support the other diagnostics? Because I know that a UVRI, Uganda Virus Research Institute, and other laboratories really did very good, a very good job in terms of diagnosis of COVID-19. Mm. And I think they also supported building remote and upcountry centers as well. Mm. But then as you do that, what is the aftermath of that mm. process? How do these facilities pick into this expertise? How do they pick into these funds that we are flowing all over the place mm. to support basic screening of diabetes, of malaria, the other day I was in Bugwedi in a health center, three, and the only thing they can test on a patient is malaria aridity. So this is a patient who has come in with fever. If malaria is positive, they may, it may be positive with another disease, but the health worker will perhaps have two options, to treat malaria alone or treat malaria and any other thing that it may be coming with because they can't test other things. So that's the system we are still dealing with. Okay. The other players that we have is, is the health worker themselves. In the COVID-19 pandemic, you saw medical workers crying out for allowances. If you looked at the report yes, I was talking about, yes. 
from Minister of Finance. You saw those, you see those funds being mm. pushed out. And this is not so different from what usually happens with medical intern doctors mm. complaining that they have not been paid. And when they go to, they usually run between three ministries or among the three ministries. That's Minister of Public Fast Service, Minister of Health, and Minister of uh, Finance and Economic Development. And they'll be told, you know, that money was released. Or Minister of, Minister of Health told us this and that. So there's, sometimes there's lack of coordination, even within mm. the cabinet itself. Mm. That if Minister of Health knew the health system as it is, it says, I have so many health center for they're supposed to provide this. Mm. I have so many district hospitals, they're supposed to provide this. Because I've visited some of, uh, some of these other health, health sectors or systems in other countries. And if you could benchmark on them and come to our country, if you made health center falls work, district hospitals work, regional referral hospitals work, national referral hospitals to work, so much that even the honorable member of parliament can use those district facilities or those regional referrals, then this money would make good sense in there. Mm. If you talk of an ICU in Ginger Hospital, Ginger Hospital Regional Referral Hospital currently has ICU equipment, kudos to the ministry, which is not being used. It has ICU equipment in a store. Why? The challenges could be systemic, systemic challenges no. because it is usually four things. You have the supplies. The supplies must occupy a space. That space must be run by staff. And then that, those staff must work within a defined system. So for, if you're going to run an ICU, you need people that are going to run it. You need the system, the Ministry of Health, the parliamentarians, to know that we have so many ICUs that are going to support people this way. Mm -hmm. They're going to need so much money. They're going to need so many supplies. We've just had an outcry recently of uh, supplies running out. I think the, we even read stories of Toro Hospital being shunned by patients or national drug, national medical stores right. being blamed. And then the blame perhaps goes back to Ministry of Health. So we, have, we are playing some bit of picky ponky mm -hmm. on health provision. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making here is if we have all big money, you can even invest 20 billion US dollars. I know sometimes money is too big to even be said in Uganda shillings. So sometimes we we'll say we spent so much mm. million dollars. Mm. But you can spend so much money, but if you don't have a system that you, which can be predictable, which can be defined even by the, the most illiterate of, the, of Ugandans. Because if you're addressing challenges, you're supposed to address challenges for the least privileged person. Mm. If you address challenges for my mother or grandmother who lives in a village that can't afford a malaria RDT test or a complete blood count test or a follow-up package for diabetes or hypertension, even if you threw so much dollars at their regional referral hospitals, they will not access it. Because my mother who is in Movende must go and get a blood pressure measured in Movende Hospital. But Movende Hospital, which is a regional referral, cannot offer further follow-ups, follow-up tests for her diabetes, for her hypertension. So she must move 140 kilometers away to Kampala to address these tests. And this is money spent. This is time wasted. Currently, Movende Roads, Movende Michana Road is pathetic. Okay, so, now so, that you're going on yeah. the roads, let me first get to our <laughs> MP. Honorable <laughs> Kakembo, do we need to change our accountability systems? Or are they working? Um... Well, this is a very sensitive topic. And I want to thank my sister here and brother for joining us. We have said it over and over again. Probably it is the system that lacks political will to do the work. In Uganda, we have a system where the appointing authority is the president, and the president has too much work. The system can work with the president who, is, who has vigor, who is very smart and strong and willing to, you know, to see things more. In a situation now we have the president, I, want, I don't want to say he's too old, but of course he has, of course, age challenges. It's not, he has more vigor to, to run the country. Mm. Mm. And the will, I say this because this is me saying it. Mm. Because nature demand is so. The doctors yes. can tell us. Yes. At my age, whatever I'm doing now, in 20 years to come, I may not be able to do them. So that's the fact of life. Yes. 
So now we can't run around. Like yes. Now, if you look at President William Seven in 1986 when he had just come to Uganda, mm. things were different. Mm. Of course, he was very strong. He was very keen. He was following mm. and everything. Now he's growing older and weaker. Mm. Many of, of the things are done by the mafias around him. Mm. And you know what they are doing now? The state house is being turned into some kind of uh, a dealer house. Clearing house. Clearing house for the deals. Whoever wants to do this, whatever they bring to him, he takes, okay, he will take it up mm -hmm. without, you know, uh, looking at it. So, you know, scientifically. Mm -hmm. uh, leaving that, as parliament, we have done our work. And I want to thank these entities that have come on board to do some accountability for some of this. Because you're going to need accountability. As, as a government, we are under obligation to, to, to account for whatever money we spend. True. And our people must see the repercussions, I mean, the effect of their money, because at the end of the day, it is them who are going to pay. Mm. Either <laughs> to pay in terms of paying back the loan we have taken, mm. or they are the, the last consumers of the services we give. Now, COVID opened many eyes, all of us in Uganda. If you had a good administrative system, COVID had brought in another opportunity for Uganda to prepare mm. in advance, to be able to manage any emergency that can come, mm. like you now the Ebola that came. But what do we see? Ugandans, companies, you know, they came out to fight and you wanted to help government, that we can see the government is in dilemma, how can we help? You, you saw how people were donating money. But the government could not see it mm. important to show accountability for the money given. Mm. Many companies came out, they gave out food, gave out money, others donated vehicles. Oh. But then the president was like, I don't need ambulances, I need pickups, double cabins. Really? In a situation of managing a, a crisis, mm -hmm. a medical crisis, that we need ambulances, mm -hmm. that maybe, it maybe. came from the president himself. Maybe we are that going I need elections. a double cabin that is four wheel drive. Can you imagine? He was, even went ahead to give a specification was it, was it for COVID of a vehicle he wants. <laughs> Was it for COVID or an election? <laughs> uh, why a four wheel drive? Were you going to the uh, mountain areas of K Kisoro, Kabale, Kanungu? You know, those hard to go areas. Mm. So you look at the motive of, you know, the president and you, so many questions are left unanswered. Really, mm. if the president had a, a political will, now I'm going to manage COVID, would you ask for an ambulance or you would prefer a double cabin pickup four wheel drive? Mm. For who? For the RDCs to go out and eat? Supervise his election Mobilize. campaigns, mm -hmm. oh. and that's the problem we have. That's what I'm saying. We are lacking a political will. In our local language, we say that fish rots from the from the head. Mm. So the problem we are facing, Ugandans, mm. are not coming from anywhere. They are coming from the head. That is the president, who is the fountain of honor, mm. the person who has all the powers. Is the appointing authority? Is the way we will report? As members of parliament, including these entities that come up with this kind of investigation mm -hmm. and the right reports, they give recommendations. Where will the recommendation go? It's the president. Because as we make our recommendations, we expect the president to take them up in good faith mm -hmm. and take action on them for the good of our country. What does he do? He does not seem to give a damn. Parliament, we did it. I'm a member of parliament. I was lucky. I was selected to be part of an selection committee that went to probe the money that was uh, uh, spent during oh. COVID. Oh. We traversed Uganda, we had quite a number of witnesses, and they gave testimonies. We went to hospitals. I'm telling you, the parliament appropriated enough money for this. Oh. In the first place, parliament, uh, the, the 10th parliament, they had appropriated over 100 and uh, were they 100 and something billion mm. for vaccine for COVID vaccine? In our investigation, we realized it was government has never purchased any vaccine by then. Most of the vaccines we're using in Uganda donations. were donations mm. from you know good countries like mm. America and others. Mm. Now we came down to ask the minister. We are seeing Minister of Finance releasing these billions to some account. Probably central medical stores. Where is the medicine? Mm. Central medical store where 
denied. They have never seen anything. And the records were very clear. Money was transferred from Ministry of Finance mm. to some account. Mm. And we're wondering which account is this one. Now we report to the president. Now, president, tell us what happened. Parliament appropriated over 13 billion for this vaccine. Money was released. Vaccines were not, you know, procured. Who do we blame now? Who do we arrest? Because the president knows all those ones. He's the appointing authority. He knows the director of medical store. He knows the minister of finance. He knows the PS of finance. I mean, I mean, PS of minister of health and others. He's the appointing authority. What has he done? Mm. All his reports, this, nothing. We will keep quiet. Parliament will come up with such reports with recommendation. We recommend so and so should be brought to book. Let him answer. Let him refund the money he misappropriated. Mm -hmm. And the president will look at you. And things will go like that. And that's how far our system is getting us, you know, in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So if we can... Now the issue of keeping Ugandan is in the, in the, dark. in the darkness. Oh. It's also a policy of government. They don't want the Ugandans to know their rights. If we have a country where people can demand for accountability, for us, we have to travel outside Uganda, a country neighboring to us here in Tanzania. The citizens of Tanzania, they demand because they know their rights. Mm -hmm. In Uganda, <laughs> Uganda will ask for a small wallaji when they see a member of parliament, for example. And when they see the president, for them, they expect the president will give us something, doggo. And that's not by accident. The president designed this that way to monetize the politics. So politicians, Ugandans believe in money. You will give us something. It's more we vote for you, go to the office, and they will never ask for any accountability. And it's the disease that eating eating this country. And the president, they're enjoying it because they're using the same money, your money, and they bring it back to you in form of bribing it for the vote. And then they go and eat other money. And nobody will ask because you don't have the moral authority to ask somebody who bought you to vote for him for service. Mm. And that's where we're having a problem. The political system is rotten. With the corruption, they don't want to anybody to know. Ugandans who do the work uh, are demanding from the president. We need this medical services. We appropriate money for 21 isolation center in Uganda as parliament. We went to Nambole. It was not functioning. We saw beds and nobody was there. They bought tents which were swept Probably. by the wind. Swept by the wind. And that's the country we are living in. We went to Naguru. Is it, there's, it's a far part of, I think, Mulago. Or donated by the Chinese. Chinese you were correcting yes. me, mm. probably. Yes. And we entered into some so called isolation, no, intensive unit. Which intensive unit was not operational. Mm. HD, Reason? High they dependence. don't even have manpower. Are you seeing how the government is poor planning? Yes, but, 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 all but of us. Honorable, before mm. you conclude, uh, if you are there, out there, might, might be wondering are you toothless? What, what I'm saying, the system makes us so. Because as members of parliament, our hands are, you know, we are limited, of course, by law and by our rules of procedure. As a member of parliament, we are here to advise government because we are a, a, a system of government that has elements within it. We have the legislature, we have us, the members of parliament, we have the executive, that's the president, and then the other side of the lawyers. This one knows them. Mm. Then how should we relate ourselves? We should be relating functionally, all of us. But the system is broken somewhere. Someone intentionally breaks off. We don't want to listen to the parliament. That's why they manipulate parliament. That's why when you see the president fighting so hard to make sure either the speaker is his person. He puts a lot of money to make sure he has, he has the majority in the parliament. For what? For manipulation. Mm -hmm. Now you can see we have a system that has been highly musevenizing. That's the parliament. And all the members of parliament will ask, what does the president say about this? Just imagine that. Mm -hmm. What is the president's say? On this, if the president say yes, then it will be. If he says no, mm. so it will be, be a no, mm. and that's the problem we have. So if we can wake up, honorable, well, I strongly like, believe. Before mm. we let you off on parliament, I strongly believe that the idea that parliament is an advisory is self-created. Mm. Parliament has an appropriation and oversight function. Right. Why the two? You have power to allocate expenditures of public you know, funds. You have a power to check whether there is value for money on, on the public funds. Yes. The framers of the Constitution 
envisage the situation where parliament can say, Minister of Health, you've not accounted. We are not discussing your budget. You have no budget until you account for the previous one. What stops you from doing that? Very good. Now, mm. as I told you, the president tries hard to make sure the humanity plays parliament. How many people will say what you're saying of parliament? As opposition, we are, we are less than 30 percent. We are over 528 members of parliament. Out of the 528, opposition, including NOOP, FDC, UPC, and DP, we are less than 150. That means the 300 and something are for the president. So you know where power rises. And the politics is a game of numbers. Whatever you, you, you do in parliament, the highs will always take the day. The highs will have it. And that's how we do our work. Parliament appropriates money. Then the Minister of Finance, together with the, the, the Permanent Secretary of Finance and the President, they do the release of fund to those the different uh, entities, entities where we have appropriated the money. We have seen a scenario where Parliament appropriated the money and the Minister of Finance tells you we had no money, so we did not release money. So whatever appropriation, appropriation you're talking about stays on paper until the next financial year. Because the minister tells you, we do not have money for that. We have always raised it, but the powers to say we are not doing that. Then the speaker will tell you, let us put it on a vote. And the majority, who are the NRMs, will tell you, for us, we are supporting President Museven, and they will go to Chiangwazi, and they will tell them what to do. They will come back very happy, and at the end of the day. So we should know where to touch. If the president says yes, all this kind of report, if you can get an interface with the president and he tell him, this fact, probably he will understand. If the president understands, the rest will be automatic. But if the president fails to understand and is left in the hands of those few mafias around him to feed him everything, the president, if he fails to understand what you are talking about, it will not move because always the president's word is final. So if you just imagine, if it is final and it's not in good faith, <laughs> the end result will be the same. So we just need to understand the system we are working under. As a parliament, we are doing our best. Imagine we did our report on COVID. Mm -hmm. And we reported each and everything, including the companies that were testing at the airport, at particular borders, and in other areas, and in the discrepancy in the, in the, in the cost. At Mutukura border, it was a different cost. At the airport, it was different. For the foreigners, it was different. For the local, it was different. All those were we reported, and we gave our recommendations. What happened? Mm. So the minister was like, we are, we are touching into, you know, is a team machine. And those are the companies. Most of them were belonging to the, to the minister. A uh, chain, uh, 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 whatever. You see how the mafias are operating. They are very dangerous. Sometimes you can call your members of family that want, you want to do something. They say, please, you stop. Don't go into that. You don't know what you are doing. Right now, I'm probing NSSF. But that's the same report we are getting. You see, we have a system that has somebody who is above the law, too strong, and all of the people around him. Now, when we look at the recruitment system in Uganda, do we have people on merit? That would be the starting point. People are employed because you're a son of somebody, you are my relative, you're my friend, you know. They don't have these jobs on merit. So they don't give a damn. Too much, they don't waste a lot of their time in doing the services. Mm. They know I am untouchable. I was brought here by a minister, by the president. My father was a good friend to the president. So they are free to, be, to use the money the way they wish. Mm. They will have a lot of poor planning. Because if we plan it so well, Uganda has a lot of money. We have so many well-wishers who are ready to give us money. Mm. But this money is misappropriated by those people who think they are too big for the law. Mm. And the president does not come out to bite. So when I bring in the, the issue of political will, that's why the president will be biting. Because if parliament has pointed the finger at my brother here, that you have taken money and the president take serious action against you. That will be enough for us. Mm -hmm. So parliament can be empowered by none, but the president himself and the executive. If the president can empower parliament, parliament will go out, they probe. After probing, they report to parliament all the recommendation we give. Then the president will be you know, held accountable. Tell us, parliament recommended you to do A, B, C, D. What happened? We are seeing ministers who are censored one time and they are here, they are seeing ministers. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's the government we have. Dr. Zara, it seems we are on our own as citizens. Because and if I've got a wrong person, if anything, if 
I was revealed to us as Ugandans through COVID. Yeah. It was that we are on our own. It because is, yeah, yeah. as other speakers have said, there is no system. Or the system that is there existing is working for the interests of a few. Now, some more information okay. on this yes. one. COVID. Many Ugandans came out and he donated. And the president was so happy. I had him on radio reading out donation coming in. No Ugandan has ever demanded before an accountability. Mm. I have never seen a but, sack But if of, you demand for it, they, they say you're anti-government. I don't know where that is. The, the, the posho, the rice, the, the cooking oil, the eggs that were donated. And the president came out and announced them on radio. Mm. I don't know anybody who can bear us witness. Who can stand here as a witness to tell us that he has ever seen a jirikan of bidiko cooking oil in somebody's home from a state house? Yes, that, COVID, uh, yes but, but the reason is because there is no information that after that donation, this, this jerrican of cooking oil has gone to move in the That's hospital. What we want to know. Yes, so how will the Ugandan the ask that for you how, by yeah, how will what? the Ugandan ask let for me, this mattress? Uh, let me ask first some hmm? Dr. Zahara, because mm. I wanted to ask you exactly on that. Mm. The information gaps. Mm. How do we deal with that? Mm. And what are key accountability concerns mm. spending today on COVID funds? Yes. The, and, and as I was saying that uh, Information is, has to come from somewhere. In order for Uganda in Muvende to ask about the food in the quarantine center, which was donated by Bidco, the cooking oil, mm. there must be information that's coming from the top to say that Muvende, no, okay. Gulu, ETC have received this number of jerrycans, which are going to be in the, in the quarantine centers. But that information was lacking. And the motives not clear. And I think if, any, if, if anything we learned through COVID was the fact that uh, there is no system really. The system that is there is working for a few individuals. Actually, as uh, Dr. Kalunji was, was saying, uh, the system that is there is so damaged that even if you pumped how many US dollars, there. there are too many leakages. You know, there are hem hemorrhages everywhere leaking. That is why money was being paid to individuals' accounts rather than to institutions. Of course, they claim this is a pandemic, it's a crisis. We have to do all that we are doing. But now with the information, I think uh, the, the, there is the issue about the fact that uh, there was a top-down approach. When all these uh, things were being done, the decisions were being taken, for example, local governments were not being included. There was no consultative process that was building from the ground upwards. Directives were coming from the minister and the president, you know, do this and do the other. So there was no involvement, there was no yeah, ownership, yeah. and there was no information flow coming from the top to the bottom. And that also created an opportunity for those persons to take advantage of COVID. COVID became the opportunity of but, the decade but now you are, for people. You are analyzing the militarization of COVID management. Not only and that. And I remember the president clearly declared that this is a war. Hmm. And that's yes. how he yes. put in RDCs in charge. Yes. It was, a, you know, the, was fighting the, 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 it was fighting as an enemy. Yeah, Sechurte was at the yes. forefront of And that is why the, was the, the incident, the incident management money. unit was one of the units was that, that was created as part of the structure. The Interministerial Sector Committee, the Incident Management Unit, headed by UPDF, yes. and then the District Task Forces. The Incident Management Committee the was very, very, very... No, there was a, there's a commander. The other for the district. Yes. The RDC. Okay. And then the, we had the one at the district that was managed by the, by the RDC. A lot of, of power. Actually, when we're doing the, uh, the, this, this invest, investigative uh, surveys at the district, the security personnel were very well facilitated. They were happy. They received the bottle of water per More day. They doctors. were paid. The village health teams, on the other hand, were not paid. Even now, I think there are still mm. payment claims Serious. that are coming mm. in. But I think it is because somebody took opportunity of that and politicized COVID. So you find that it was actually a political you know, campaign, a mobilization, rather than a health issue. It became mm. a, you know, a political entity headed by RDCs, uh, headed by the RCCs, it was actually something that we failed to take advantage there of our technical a people. At the police headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So rather than having these <laughs> teams, <laughs> yes, rather than having these teams being te led <laughs> by te you know, technical personnel, we had the teams being led by the political people. So it became a political matter. 
you know, and remember that was the yeah, time yeah, that yeah. we were going into mm. the what? Mm. Into the election. So it was an unfortunate thing that we did not learn the lessons from COVID. Rather, we are still paying and we are going to pay for a very long time. My second question, mm. how, what are some of the key outstanding accountability issues? Okay, so um, one of the things that we discovered was that there was a lot of waste. Too many leakages. Uh, right now, um, we don't have a, a proper comprehensive audit report. Yes, we have something that has been done by Parliament. But even that which has been done by the Auditor General has missing information. Issues, when the report came to Kosase, uh, and Kosase was asking the members from the Auditor General, what about this? What about this? They also did have answers to it. So, of course, there are issues of wastage. There are issues of corruption. And uh, transparency and accountability is lacking as a, as, you know, as a fact. Mm. But I want to draw it back to you know, the public and also to the parliamentarians. I believe that our parliamentarians are disabling themselves. There's the opportunity, for example, to call ministers during question time. Every week, call the Minister of Health and say, we have appropriated this amount of money. What has happened? There were late disbursements, you know? These issues were not dealt with. Everybody ran away during COVID and hid themselves, but nothing happened afterwards. I think we, we need to reawaken the soul of Ugandans, starting with the parliamentarians and going lower down. Because well, if we keep saying that the, the head is rotting from the top, Nobody is going to come and, and, and remove this head if the questions just don't start coming from Uganda. So we need these audits to come in because we need information so that Ugandans can start to ask uh, those questions. We know the corrupt officials. At least you say that information is there. The tenderpreneurs, people who got the big tenders, that information is there. The lists are there. No procurement followed. Why aren't you calling these people? Why aren't you naming them? Why aren't you shaming them? You know? But uh, can that still work? Do people still have shame? <laughs> no. Would, let, let me go to... Give him okay. okay. <laughs> if first give us information on our I to give you some group. information. Yes. You know, we talked about Parliament being, uh, I think, weak and uh, not strong enough. We've this. tried to, to bite. Mm. I'll give you an example. The Minister of Health, for example. Mm. And there are these kind of play, uh, blame games all the time. You call the minister, after this, yes, I wrote this disposition, but the minister of finance. Then you call the minister of finance, please come and tell us. Minister of health, we appropriate this money for the ambulance, we appropriate this one for this, even salary increment. What happened? Say, so, you know, I'm a father, you know, when the cake is too small, I must divide it according to the available resource envelope. Now the money was little, so I did not, you know, send money yeah. to them. And the AI is moving just like that until the financial elapses. So the problem is the Minister of Finance again has serious issues. If you could you know interest yourself one time to come to Parliament and see how the Minister of Finance can answer some of us. You have seen him on radio. But, 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 like but honorable there's a lot of the resource money. envelope was there because we received a huge amount of money. It was there but, but who is accountable for it? That's the minister that's where the money goes. And it's the one who's supposed to send the money to different entities. Send the money here. Yes, send but the money if there. the money comes in for COVID if it money. comes in for COVID so he appropriates it to other things because all mm -hmm. children must get. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Because I, we I think, I think Ugandans are, are having really a very big dilemma, Sarah. Very big problem. We, it looks like we have institutionalized corruption, institutionalized recklessness. Like because the dilemma is in a so that you have a good list of uh, items going to be procured. Ambulances, ICU Mass. equipment, masks. On paper, they look really nice. But the dilemma is in a way that uh, we don't know why these people are prioritizing this. Very good. The political leadership. Yeah, now, so someone, you don't know why someone's prioritizing this because it's actually going to help you or because they are going to benefit from that list. Mm. So I know that uh, we're going to say, why doesn't Parliament do this? Why don't Ugandans come out? But I think we are, we are addressing a political problem. This it's is not a, a technical problem. problem. It's a political problem. Uganda maybe. is not short of doctors that can run health centers and hospitals well. It's not short of technical people at the Ministry of Health headquarters. It's not short of the money. It's not the short of good have. policies. 
Parliament released two good reports regarding COVID. One by the Canton, to, uh, the popular Canton to report, the Canton, uh, the and then the other one, the Ayume report. Ayume. Mm. These two reports, if you read these two reports, you don't even need to read anywhere else. But now the political if will you come implemented in. them the way they are, the fast. health system in Uganda would start to be used by so even the head of state. So are you saying, I know, man, and I want this to be my words, because I don't put you in trouble. Mm. Are we saying that the fish rots from the head? That's I what think, I say. I think for, I'll give you some, it one rots example. from the head. You've been to countries, for example, if we get our top leaders being treated... Abroad. In Kenya, in, in Berlin, in South, South Africa. Why do such people still lead our health system? Because, let me just say this. That's a nice if, question. If you're a minister of health. And you want to be treated if from you're, Kenya. If you have a health committee in parliament, mm. which says it's looking after health, our health. But the same parliament is going to give its parliamentarians health insurance to take those parliamentarians elsewhere. And then... <laughs> These same parliamentarians are discussing how we should receive health care. I feel like we have a lot of uh, dishonesty on the side of our leaders. Uganda is not short of expertise. If you looked at lawyers, if you looked at doctors, if you looked at engineers for roads, if Uganda sit down and sat down, sorry, and Plan looked where? at its policies, even not short of policies, if you looked at those two reports, if I sat with the Minister of Health and the President and we looked at those two reports alone, because the Cantun report that I read really page to page, that was my back report. to back, talks about the health centers, the diagnostic incapacities that they have, the health care, the, health, the medical workers that are lacking. And those are the things I'm talking about. If you get big COVID money, look at the system as it is. Define what would COVID need in terms of diagnostics, in terms of health workers, in terms of space, like I was already saying. What in that particular area do we strengthen? If you buy 10 ambulances and they're all over the place, they're not running in any kind of organized system. You're only wasting money. And we know them. And they will be packed in one So bag. we have equipment that is bought very expensively, but it them. rots yes. in stores We've because there is no system in which it will operate. So the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here is transparency and accountability are not things that you find from people who don't want to offer it. Many times I'm on forum, I'm on forum with uh, top ministry officials, top doctors, and I ask some of these questions. But guys, if we are doctors in Uganda, why do we have people in Kampala that live in places that are inhabitable? You go to a place where drainage channels are running along people's homes. But we are doctors in this country. We have uh, city health officers. We have minister of health. I feel like we have done a very big disservice in to people country. in this country who are yeah. not educated. We are not showing any kind okay. of example. Okay, you know, and I'm sure the viewer there is thinking of Barrio Monsi, Dr. Barrio Monsi. <laughs> yeah, very who, unfortunate event. Yes, but, uh, uh, who went to his uh, constituency hospital and there was no Panadol, no oxygen, mm -hmm. and he had to be airlifted to Kampala. Yeah, but, but, but again, yes. uh, when you look at transparency and accountability, these are not things that we should plead for. It's a right, it's actually only proper, it's... It's good manners. Yes, that and, if I and give doctor, you, that if I gave you doctor, money, I want to come yeah. to the way forward. Yeah. We have all talked about we you know the what problem. went wrong, what could have been mm. done better. Can we be systematic now? Ah. For example, in the medical sector, I know that the National Medical Stores tries to share information mm. of what they've distributed, delivered, and it helped a bit during vaccination mm. for COVID. Mm. But not everybody is doing that. So what can we, what have we learned? What are our lessons from the COVID bad experience? What can we do better? What reforms do we need? Starting with you. So three things. Number one, lack of proper information sharing is intentional. I've shared, mess like I told you, I've shared messages with people. If you got any district health, health, health officer, if you got any minister of health, if, if, if you got even a parliamentarian, and you tell them, but you, Mr. Mr. MP, you come from Tororo district. What is in Toro District? What is Toro District benefiting from your being a parliamentarian? So lack of information sharing is intentional because one side, it denies someone what they think, what, so what they should know. Number two, it denies them what is actually being shared or being appropriated. Mm -hmm. So now if we could, as advocates and people who are talking about these things, if we could go out there and push these people to start sharing information, for starters, small things that would have very big impact. Because having these conversations and dialogues are good, 
But if the Minister of Health will still not share what is being planned, what is going to be done where, we're still wasting time with this. Number two, the other thing that we need to look at on top of information sharing is we need to start putting people to task to explain certain things that, are, that they're supposed to be explaining. Mm. If you have a leadership, social leadership, the other day I was listening to a speech by the executive director of Kampala. She was trying to explain how we are in this mess of potholes. And she mentioned to us the number of political leaders that have been come in Kampala, over 1,400. <laughs> so if you have political leaders, big in number, 529 MPs, mm. 1,000, so many, mm. Uganda, I think, is the a country with, that is not shy, vision. that is not short of political leadership. But where is this advocacy? So we need to start really getting, if an MP came from a district where there is no hospital, we need to start asking them to seek health care in their own places as well. And I agree with the MP that this kind of push is going to be, is supposed to start be said by us, the, the public. So if you have an MP who does not take their children to this poor health, to the poor school in their, in their constituency, but for 20 years they keep saying they're representing that constituency, the public, not that I'm inciting it, should come out and demand. But final and most importantly is, the point that I need to stress here is that we are not short of expertise, we are not short of policy documents. What we are short of is perhaps the willingness, the selflessness, and the, and, um, human, the human behavior, human feeling for humanity. That, you know, if I'm able to enjoy good health care in Nairobi Hospital, why doesn't someone from Butaleja equally enjoy, okay, 50% of that? Because perhaps some Ugandans are enjoying 10% of what our leaders enjoy elsewhere. Mm. So, in conclusion, around the way forward, mm. as people who call themselves advocates and people like you who are running this very important space, we need to start putting these people, to, not just having conversations with them, but ask them, you know, uh, there's a joke that some of our, our leaders usually make that, you know, one of our leaders in the medical association, that, you know, in public, you, if a doctor is good for stealing, say, a microscope or something, come out and say what he did is not wrong. Sorry, what he did is wrong mm. and improper. Mm. But of course, it's because it's our, it's our own, we will try to stand with him in public. If you go with him back in the, in the corridors, and this is what I'm asking from the MP, if you go with the minister in the corridors, who is your fellow MP? You tell them, I know, and Madam Minister, yes, you're our own, and we shall not really push you so much in public, but please tell us what happened to this money. What happened to this? What happened to this equipment? Why don't we work for our people? Why don't we provide for them a system that will treat them? So, we can mention a hundred things we can do, but I feel like this is going to be something of people trying to have a self-reflection, think about other people just like they think about themselves, think about other people just like they think about their children. If POE results are released, <coughs> and you're the minister. Your child goes to a private school in Kampala. They, they're actually crying because they got aggregate fire. But there's someone who is looking up for your support in the village, and they didn't even sit for primary living examinations. So same for education, same for health. The same way you fly to India for a general medical checkup on government money is the same way you should think about someone in Nakapi Pirit in Kabale who just needs basic screening. So when you get all this into the COVID-19 dilemma, everything that we're going to do, be it Ebola or COVID-19 or non-communicable diseases that like we're talking about now, let's get whatever we are planning and the money that we are going to get aligned with the system. Don't just get money that you know, this money is for diabetes and then you throw around to national referrals or regional referrals peoples. First look at the system and see, how can the money for national, sorry, for non-communicable diseases, for Ebola, for COVID-19, fit into the system as it is. So that at the, at the end of the day, when all this money is spent, you actually have a system which is strengthened and services being enjoyed by the people. I'll come mm. straight to you, Honorable. Mm. Yes. I know, mm. you know, I'm among the Global Health Systems latest well. report for <laughs> management of COVID. Yes. Thailand emerged number six in the top 10 countries mm. that had a farm healthcare system mm. and managed well COVID pandemic without necessarily spending so much money like Uganda did. And it's the only non-high income country mm. in the top 10 mm. countries. 
I know that they have a national response authority for pandemics, mm. among other things. <laughs> so what lessons can we pick from COVID? <laughs> the lesson. What can we do? Because I didn't even know, but uh, Thailand has an authority. No, like, no, no, you have national mm, drug authority. Yes, yes. We don't have pandemics. an authority, but we have a the less, lesson system. Lesson number one is mm. very pandemics. clear that we have issues with our system and the way it operates. Mm. So if we continue with the same system, the way forward, my humble appeal to the civil society, including you, the entities who come up to help us, find time and preach to the president one time. You can organize a breakfast, something for the president, and interact with the president, probably. <laughs> you can invite the president for a cup of tea, make an appointment. You go with all these kind of... Because for you, you are not politicians like us. He will be biased when he sees the politician, like me. Ah, you are, and what do I expect from you? That's what you can say. They're already biased. But civil society can help us. Because if you preach the right person, that is the president. Because as for our system, he's everything. He's the Alpha and Omega. Let us begin with him. So civil society can also help us as we do that. Two, civil society can also help us to, well, build local capacity, mindset change of our people. Uganda should wake up to some realities. That Ugandans should demand for accountability. If Ugandans start demanding for accountability, instead of asking for Waraj whenever they see politicians, instead of asking for Bitano Bitano whenever there's somebody who is looking for the vote, they should begin asking them, what are you going to do for us? Mm. I remember when I had just, just joined Makerere in 1996, there was a civil organization, it was a civic education from PIDISA. Some students from PG, mm. Makerere University, they, start, they had started a civic kind of you know, educating our people. And by the way, they had been given the 2000, 2000, 1996 elections. Mm. They were very good, you know, very, very visible on ground, mm. educating Ugandans into how to vote, or, you know, those kind of things. But there are no more. We, we don't know what happened. Mm. We don't have funders because Ugandans have a problem. You can even cry when you see Ugandans thinking the way they are thinking. They don't seem to care. Nobody can even ask the president, please, where is our, you know, the donation we got from COVID, what happened to it? Nobody can even ask you that. Because the politicians know that we are, leading, we are leading a population that is so green, so ignorant, you know, so careless. So they are free, they are liberty to do whatever they want to do because they don't ask them. You can imagine in the villages, MPs, they just go back for votes when campaign time comes. They don't even go there. They, mm. they no longer have the consultative meetings. They don't interact with their voters. How many times have you seen a member of parliament interacting? Because this one is driven, sometimes it's demand driven. When the population demands for that, you will always go back and ask. But because the population demands for Waraj, so people go for Waraj and they give them Waraj. Who is mm. going to help us build local capacity? Mm. Change the mindset of Ugandans, including the president. The president is very sick because he's isolated in a group in a state house with a few mafias around him. And for him, he thinks that's the, that's the Uganda. <laughs> so the only person who can penetrate, you know, a neutral person is civil society. Because you have the power, you are against that, just convene a meeting with the president. Have an interface with the president. Tell the president this. You give him the report. Because most of these reports, the president won't get a chance of looking at those reports. If we can do that, I'm telling the president will be another person the next day. Mm -hmm. The problem, that's where it comes from. The system. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zahara, what do we need to do differently? I think, uh, Dr. Sarah, you uh, you have seen that responsibility that has been placed on you. <laughs> yes. It's a big one. It's on civil society. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I also don't know. I also don't know. I also don't know. I 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 don't know. What is clear from the COVID uh, pandemic is the fact that uh, we have a total system breakdown in yeah, this country. A system. We have no institutions, you know, the institutions are not working as well as they should. And yet, as you have mentioned in, in you know, for the Thailand issue, yeah. you know, Thailand was able to manage because they have a system in place. But we are not devoid of laws and policies in this country. Mm. We, have. we have them. We have a strong constitution. Of course, they, it's being eaten up That's slowly by slowly. We have very good yeah, laws. In our engagement with the different stakeholders, we also realized we even have guidelines on, on emergencies, health emergencies. So it's not like we don't have these things in place. But I think what is also clear is that uh, whereas we have this good institution and policy framework, the system, the political will 
for it to work has also broken down. And as a result of this, the citizen is no longer at the core of this conversation. The citizen is by themselves, Again. and then there, is a, there are individuals who are also, you know, pre pretending mm. to work. Let me call it pretending to work. Um, unfortunately, we, therefore, that we have a citizen that has lost trust in the state. Can I give you something small, information on the system? Now, when you look at the system of governance in Uganda, you find we have two people. We have the technical crutch and the politician. And the, but the system, the technical crutch are above everything. You find even the minister has not much power over the technical crutch, headed by the, 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 the PS in the ministry. And in local government, we have the cow. In the municipalities, we have the town clubs. That kind of system, you know, separation of power, who, it brings conflict. Who has power over the other? Mm -hmm. You know, I am appointed by the president. This one is elected. A, com a commission by the in commi finance has yes. refused to return. Yes, and they will tell you, they, I don't have money. <laughs> a politician will come and ask the PS, please, we need the money to do this. And he tells you, Oh, honorable. For them, they are, so, they are so humble. You know how you behave. Honorable, you see, because they, you know, we like those respects. You know, but there is no money, honorable, you see. And that's their show. So the system that brings conflict also between the politician and the technical staff, who is the boss over the other, who supervises mm -hmm. another, that mm -hmm. also brings challenges in the driving performance. Who is it to drive or who to perform? Mm -hmm. Does the and minister drive a PS? Does, does the chairperson of the yeah. district? Drive the cow to do whatever they do. But for us, we are taking see, because we are the senior advisors. Because of, of that, us, politicians. Mm. Because of that That's dilemma, somebody stands to benefit very from the well. fact that it is not working. So we have, for example, a, a, a system policy framework on decentralization that is excellent. If the way we had laid out our decentralization model could work, our local governments would work. But now we have only thirteen percent, you know, budget going to local governments. What can they do with that? So we have systems that have dis been disabled. You know, we have a citizenry that has been disempowered. And we have this, these persons who are actually taking advantage of this. But I want to go back to the citizen. Uh, Honorable, you said that now this is civil society. But it is not civil society. It is everybody Everyone. in this country. Everybody. It is civil society. It is you academia. It is researchers. It is students. It is teachers. If the teachers' uh, um, relief funds are not being paid... What are you doing as teachers? A few teachers are being collected to go to Korea airstrip with the head politics, of the teachers. Have you seen? Politics comes yeah, in and where are the rest? I am seeing the Everybody, I call NSS upon Ugandans. Everybody must play their role. If we have a white elephant in the room that and we want to problem. infect this elephant with malaria so that this malaria they, they will die and we have a transparent and accountable system, all of us must bite. All of us must in infect with malaria. So I call upon everybody. There is a role for everybody to play, whether it is information, whether Including it is capacity donors. building, if whether donors it is donors. Put conditions donors. On their money to be so very good. everybody has a role to play. Are you not talking of white elephants? We have not talked. We have not talked of Luwawa Hospital. <laughs> no, no. Yes, it's, it's actually, also a COVID hospital. Terrible. Doctor Karunja, what is that? Your parting shots. Mm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, these are painful parting shots because we are talking about very pertinent issues. We're talking about a very important sector of health, not because I'm a practitioner in this sector, but because nothing can happen if someone is not healthy. So my call is really to all of us, like doctors said, but most importantly and more so to our leaders and the elites, the educated poor in charge of the health system. It is very unfair, very, it's bad manners, like I said, for us to pretend to be providing a health system to our people, and yet we are not doing so. We have overwhelming evidence that the health system is not working because those who are in charge of it do not use it. So if we get any other opportunity, like COVID came, opportunity of course not in a good way, but if we get any other opportunity for us to get such money running to a health system or the education system or any other system in this country, I think the only way we are going to change our country is not by going to some school to be taught to be patriotic by people who are not patriotic themselves, but by coming out to say that uh, every little, every single Ugandan in this country deserves good services, 
not because they are MP or minister or educated, but because they are human beings. <coughs> so in the world of fairness, in the world of accountability, in the world of offering service, we, we call upon every, little, every single person who is in charge of any docket in this country to think about the Ugandans, to think about their role as a role of changing someone's life, mm. not as a role of owning a mansion or a land cruiser. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Let me Dr. ask a question. Zahar. Yes. yes. Um, if we passed a policy as a country that no one, no one is above the law and no one shall use public funds to access health facilities as a policy, if we pass that, if you want to go to India as a judge, use your money. Use your money. They will steal it. Still, the they will steal it. If we had a policy, order, if we had that directive of policy, That's we did change you. the health he system in this country. Maybe a new president. Do you know what he has just said? A new president. No member parliament should fly one. out. Are, they, are you right? We are no longer because the president said so. No troops. External okay. Troops. So let me, Doctor, your parting shot. Yes. Uh, no, I, I really just said that uh, that we no policy. The yes, policy that let's, nobody let's pass a policy. We nobody policy. goes on treatment. Yes. But I'll, I'll the use policy, a a without the political will that, not to work. Just that one. We have quite a number and of policies see. on papers. If they don't have any political will to drive them, they will not work. So the president has issues. I still insist we need to visit the president and they have an interface with him. Bonne Bokafe, are those your parting shots? We want to add something. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't Please conclude to, to the viewers. <laughs> conclude to the viewers. Well, my conclusion, one, I want first of all to thank this team and the Space TV for mm. inviting us to come and share with our people. Mm. These are our views and we feel uh, they're partners. They can help us change our country because we love Uganda. That's why we're wasting a lot of time here. We need to make something, at least to, to, to see a change in our country for the good of all of us. I want to thank you, and uh, probably the donors who give us, of course, uh, facilitation to have this one in place. Yes, I want the president, again, I want to insist if we can have an interface with him. Let us not leave the president to politicians and the mafias, because they will influence him according to what they want him to do for them. Mm -hmm. Let the civil society wake up to this reality, at least for once. To visit the president and have an interface, have a cup of tea with the president, we tell him without fear of ever. Probably, if he wakes up today, President tells you, I don't want to see any minister going abroad for any treatment. And it's the president. That will be a presidential directive. You never see any minister flying out. And you will see them fidgeting around now, you know, to make our system work a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if we still have the same, even the ministers who have schools, how can they manage the means of education? They're in private practice. They have their private schools, very expensive schools. And now they are the minister managing the education system for the government. We hear it. Mm -hmm. A doctor is having a powerful hospital of himself and is now managing a public hospital for the government. You know, this kind of conflict. So, they we need to, them so if the president yes, comes yes, out and says, yes, yes, they will, that is the intention. They are creating uh, uh, customers for their own business. Mm. You know, I am laughing. President Ruto <laughs> declared recently that all his children are in public schools. Yes, we we'll begin from that. Not take them to private schools because private public schools no. should work for everyone. Tell you, yes. I am a member of parliament for Entebbe. I have eight of my kids. They all study in Entebbe schools. Hmm. I told them, I'm a member of parliament here. Okay. I can't take my kids outside the Entebbe. Uh, uh, They're in Entebbe, hmm. in a public school. I think our, ti fight. our time is up. Hmm. And, uh, we I, should begin from there. I hmm. was really looking at the proposal by the minister and challenge that the civil society should have an interface with the president. Yeah, a and I'm thinking, time. okay, so how many people on social media would use such a picture to say civil society exactly. has been bought mm -hmm. by the president, mm -hmm. not, not through our toxic politics. Mm -hmm. But... That's a conversation for you, and let's <laughs> continue. And it's our duty as citizens to call for accountability. Great. Till next time, bye bye.